Welcome to each and every one of you. We're thrilled that you can be here, particularly with the weather that's happening. My name is Steve Rostin. I'm the Executive Director of the John F. Kennedy Library Foundation. And on behalf of Jamie Roth from the library and all of the library and foundation team, this is a very special night. And we really appreciate your being here and our, and our very special guests. Um, before we talk about them, I want to acknowledge our underwriters for the forum, lead sponsor Bank of America, the Lowell Institute, and our media sponsors, The Globe, Affinity, Affinity, and WBUR. Um, later on this evening, there'll be an opportunity for questions, and our great team will be passing around cards, uh, three by five cards. If you have questions, you can write them, and then they'll come around later and collect them, and they'll, uh, we'll answer, you know, Ambassador will be able to answer some of those. We also want to thank those who are joining us, either from C-SPAN that are joining us, we appreciate that, also streaming, including from the John F. Kennedy Library, I'm sorry, the John F. Kennedy Museum in Hyannis, and other folks streaming, so it's great to be here. It's also this room, I, for those of you when you're coming in, you may have noticed, this is a Stephen Smith room. And so when I say literally there's no place in the world we'd rather be doing this, I mean, literally, there is no place in the world that is much more appropriate. So we're thrilled as part of this. Many of you know this is part of the centennial of President Kennedy's birth. In the Globe, today was an article about an event we're doing in this room on February 20th where the post office has a new stamp dedicated after the president, and we do a variety of activities. Please check the website out during the year. We'd love to have you participate in, in many of those activities. We believe... President Kennedy's legacy and ideals are even more relevant today than at any other time in, in recent years. That our, our moderator, Aline McNamara, is, is a great friend of the library. She's also a professor of practice at Brandeis University. She is a former Pulitzer Prize columnist at the Globe, has written a few books, and is in the midst of a, writing another one on Eunice Kennedy's Shriver. So we're thrilled that Aline can be back with us. Um, Stephen Kennedy Smith is the, he has a book coming out in a few months. He's a co-editor of JFK, A Vision of America. He has a sting, distinguished academic uh, career, both at Harvard and Columbia, and has served in leadership roles, both in the campaigns of Senator Edward Kennedy, in business practices. He's also on our board and been involved in so many other community activities. Um, well, upstairs, we were wrestling who gets to in introduce the ambassador, because there's so many great things, and Stephen is going to get to do the full uh, introduction, but I just want to say a few brief things. <laughs> that might will only be 10 or 15 minutes. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> this book, which is amazing, uh, many of you I know have already read it. If you haven't, it's available in the bookstore, and uh, the ambassador will be signing copies later on as well. Um, but it ends with a great quote from her father when he writes to Brother Bobby Kennedy, who is 14 years old. It is boys of your age who are going to find themselves in a very challenged, changed world. And the only thing we hope we hold up in your end is to prepare your mind so you'll be able to accept each situation as it comes along. So I beg of you, don't waste your time. If there's something that capsulizes the ambassador's career is not wasting her time. Whether it's raising four amazing children, serving as, as ambassador, the very special arts, and so much more that Stephen can talk about. So with that, let me introduce Stephen Kennedy Smith. Stephen? Thank you, Steve. I apologize, I have a bit of a cold. Um, as you were reading, um, something struck my mind, which is the Kennedy family motto um, is actually consider the end. And uh, I think that both means consider the end to which you dedicate your efforts and consider the end of your life and how you want to use your life. So I thought that the introduction you made is, is very appropriate. Um, I am Stephen Kennedy Smith, the son of Gene Kennedy Smith, the youngest and most beautiful of all the Kennedy sisters. <laughs> How's it going so far, Mom? <laughs> Good, okay. 
Um, so if you want to, you know, I drove over here tonight from Harvard Square where I live, just one block from the Sheridan Commander Hotel, which is where JFK launched his congressional bid in 1946. And my grandfather held a white tie dinner party at which he not only paid for all the food, but he also paid all the guests to come. <laughs> um, so it was a smashing success. But you know, it's a pity that we can't see out this window because if you look out this window, you would see the JFK Federal Building in the distance. And I used to go up there with my uncle. If you, if you really want to understand the Kennedy story, I used to go up to my uncle's office and he would point out to me where my great-grandfather, P.J. Kennedy, went to work on the Boston docks when he was 14 years old after his parents died of cholera and where my grandmother was born in the North End at a time when Irish were discriminated against in Boston and look out over to Brookline where my mother was born. And so the Kennedy family is really a family of immigrants who really um, Boston gave everything to. And I think our family wanted to give something back to the state and to the nation that had given them so much. Um, and my mother is part of that generation that worked and sacrificed stoically for, um, you know, the good of her country. And so I'm very, very proud um, to introduce her tonight, and I'm looking forward to what she has to say. Come on up. Thank you very much for your very warm welcome. And I'm especially delighted, of course, that this is in the Stephen Smith room, as I understand. Was, is that right? <laughs> uh, who, as you know, is my husband, was my husband. And so it gives it a special meaning to me. So thank you very much for coming. I, uh, I'm a little bit late because I am from New York City, temporarily. <laughs> and. Uh, uh, so we had to take the train, and then we took the cars, and then, oops, the whole thing was, uh, was a long voyage. <laughs> but I'm so happy to be here. And uh, I have to tell you that I feel very much at home, because the Kennedys, Boston is home. So I'm delighted to be here, <laughs> and, I, and I think that I will read, perhaps, I can't read the whole book, I mean, nobody can. <laughs> but... Um, Maybe two excerpts tonight, which would be interesting for you to hear. So shall I start here? So now we'll begin. Uh, and this is the introduction to the book. Uh, could I'm sorry, could I have it? Thank you very much. Uh, Sorry about that, but I have a cold as well. Uh, uh, anyway, so I'll begin with the introduction. Uh, central to our lives and to the people we would become were our parents, Rose and Joe Kennedy. They influenced the nine of us so profoundly, yet so subtly, that I hardly understood the impact myself until I looked back, back decade, decades later through mature eyes. Mother and dad both descended from Irish immigrants, a fact that profoundly affected their outlook on life and the choices they made for their family. They were very con conscious of the tremendous oppression their ancestors had overcome and were extremely grateful to be Americans. Like other young people of their generation who were the grandsons and granddaughters of immigrants, mother and dad felt a duty to go back to the country that had embraced their family and to contribute to its continued growth. To whom much has been given, much is expected. Mother repeated those words to, to us often, quoting the Gospel of St. Luke. She was not admonishing us, she was challenging us. Mother and dad felt it was important for us to know how lucky we were. On some days, your ancestors had no idea where their next meal was coming from, 
mother would remind us. In contrast, we had a roof over our heads and we had hot food in our table every night. Mother and dad let us know that we had an obligation to give back. More, I don't know if this it follows, but uh, more than one million Irish people died. Another million were forced to emigrate, boarding so-called coffin ships for far off destinations, such as America and Australia. They left behind fruitless fields, stoic fathers, and distraught mothers who took their last pence and their last hopes, tucked their last, their last pence and their last hopes into the pocket of their sons and daughters embarking on those ships. My great-grandparents were among them. They hailed from countries, counties like Wexford and Limerick. They all shared the same desire to make a better life for themselves in America. Once they arrived, these young Irish immigrants flooded the ports and streets of Boston, as you all know these stories, but like millions who came before and after them from towns and villages around the world, they sought jobs, food, and solace in a country built on the principle that everyone is welcome. Yet millions who came before and after them, they quickly found that the promise of America was tarnished by anger, distrust, and fear. Members of the Boston establishment, descendants of immigrants themselves, were not welcoming of these new arrivals. Some Boston shopkeepers made their disapproval of the Irish abundantly clear in the signs they hung in their shop windows. No Irish need apply. No Irish need apply get greeted my two grandfathers when as young men eager to excel, they went out on the streets of Boston looking for work. No Irish need apply still hung in the windows of shops when my mother was a young girl. As a child, I often imagined mother walking along the city streets with grandpa, her tiny hand holding fast to his giant mitt. In my imagination, just as they approached an unwelcoming shop, grandpa would steer mother across the road to the opposite sidewalk, saving her the humiliation of seeing the sign hanging in the window directed at them. Despite this odd outward hostility, just one generation after their parents stepped on Boston soil, my Kennedy and Fitzgerald grandfathers had earned a place as a prominence in, the traditional Brahmin, in that traditional Brahmin town. Dad's father, Patrick Joseph, or PJ, started working on the city's docks and then went into business on his own when he opened a local pub. Mother's father, John Honey Fitzgerald, rose to be a singular force in Boston politics. He served in Congress and to the dismay of some of the city's establishment, was elected city's first Irish Catholic mayor. As a young woman coming of age in Boston and the mayor's daughter, mother was the toast of the town. Yet she still felt something was amiss. As she started to make friends, she realized that the clubs that welcomed other ladies of the town did not open their doors for her, despite her connections to City Hall. At the turn of the century, there was still an unspoken rule that Irish Catholics were not allowed in social and business circles of Boston. Ever a pragmatist, mother was not angry or hurt by those realities. She decided that if you were not accepted into one club, then you should just start one of your own. So in 1910, mother initiated, initiated her own ladies club, the Ace of Clubs, where young unmarried Catholic women could meet, who addressed the matters of the day. As the club's records show, one week, the ladies welcomed Boston Herald, columnist E.E. E. Whiting, who shared his, quote, wide knowledge of political situations. Two weeks later brought a Mrs. Crawford, who spoke on European situations, including the League of Nations. The club was an immediate success, and soon membership in it became highly prized. The Ace of Clubs remained open for 100 years to follow. Now, I did, not include this, I did not include this story in my book purely because I forgot it. My son, Stephen, <laughs> reminded me of this story and asked me to tell it to you this evening. So I'm, this is not in my book, but it's a very funny story, so I'm going to tell it to you. This is uh, President Clinton. Mrs. Clinton came to visit me when I was ambassador to Ireland, which was probably, what, seven years ago now? 
uh, about seven years. And so Kim was out with her beau and was not, had not arrived in time to see Mr. and Mrs. President and Mrs. Clinton, but they were staying at the embassy. So uh, lo and behold, Kim came in, I'd say about two o'clock in the morning, and coming down the steps was President Clinton. And I don't think she knew, I know she didn't know he was there, who he was at the time coming down the stairs, but I don't think she thought it was the President of the United States, which he was. <laughs> so, so they stared at each other apparently, and I, everybody else was in bed. And uh, he said, could you tell me where to get a coat? And she thought, actually, that he said, coat. <laughs> and she said, oh, yes, yeah, sir. She didn't know who he was. And she went to the end of the hall, where there was a large coat closet, which she opened up. And then he went in, and then she went in. And she told me this story the next morning. And they stared at each other. <laughs> So, so he didn't know what to, where he was, and she didn't know what she was doing in the closet with him. <laughs> but in any case, uh, they straightened it all out, and he said he had said Coke, Coke meaning Coca-Cola. So <laughs> they worked it out, and she went in the kitchen and everything. I went fine, <laughs> and, but it was very funny, funny at the time, and, and uh, he was always a very good sport. He never told anyone. <laughs> But, uh, and she was very excited that she'd been with the president. But, uh, and finally, Stephen, you told me to tell another story, didn't you? Not about her. Oh. And then finally, I guess because I think you told me not to read too long. Stephen told me not to. I had several <laughs> other, wonderful, <laughs> other wonderful stories to tell you, but Stephen said, don't talk to me. Uh, <laughs> so my, my, these are two stories I left out of my book. Uh, and the other one was for Muhammad Ali, which uh, he was at the Kennedy Center one day, and they were showing him through. And then one of the ladies who was in charge of everything, I said, Jean, could, would you come here a minute? Because I have the, the, the head of the uh, China Seas or whatever is here, and I have to go right now. And this is Muhammad Ali, and I've been showing him through it. He's almost finished. You take, you take him through the rest, please. So I said, fine. I was terrified, of course, because he's so famous, and I didn't, have, I didn't know anything about boxing. But anyway, I sort of swaggered around <laughs> like I did. And um, so at the end, he said to me, thank you so much. I said, I think I have to go back now. But he said, what did you say your name was again? And I said, my name's Gene Kennedy Smith. And he said, if I was you. I dropped the Smith. <laughs> it was really, I didn't know what to say. <laughs> but anyway, I think that's my time, isn't it? I do, I do hope you enjoy the book. <laughs> Thank you. We know who the storyteller is here, <laughs> clearly, <laughs> clearly. Um, so we're just going to have a little chat amongst ourselves about your book, and you can share any anecdotes that you like from the books, and maybe we'll prompt you about some that we particularly enjoyed. That work for you, <laughs> Why Stephen? are you looking at me? <laughs> sure. <laughs> Stephen made all these arrangements. He That's did. why what? we called you all together. We have a family crisis. <laughs> <laughs> and you want everyone's opinions. Right. <laughs> You know no, what, why, if you wouldn't mind, if you, could you tell us, Ambassador, why you chose at this moment to write this book and share your childhood with us? Uh, well, because I think that my parents were very unusual uh, as parents, in spite of the time they lived in and everything. But given the time they lived in, they were even more exceptional. And I think, um, with the, and they also had a large um, amount of children to, to take care of and to watch over. And um, I tried to point out in the book a little bit about how uh, mother and dad, dad too, very much uh, uh, sort of steered us in a direction 
and made it very uh, clear that we had a responsibility being in, in America to do something for our country. That was, <clears throat> that was very, very clear. And that was number one. Mm -hmm. And I think it's the thing, you know, because my brothers are so famous now, and I think they were certainly driven by that. And Dad was a very loving parent, but he was also strong. When he said something, you got the message. You did it, right? <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I think uh, that they were unusual that way. And they, um, they always, you know, kept us interested. It wasn't a big labor of, uh, oh, dear, we have to do that again or something like that. And it's so difficult. And, not, and it was always interesting. And you, the news is interesting most of the time. And, Very uh, interesting these days, Ambassador. <laughs> I know. Um, but uh, so I think the children, and they did, we all enjoyed it because we had different opinions and they always listened to what Jack thinks we should not uh, go into the war either. On, this is World War. Uh, but if he goes, we, we all have to serve and do we all have to serve? And the girls never get, will get in the army when, you know, all that sort of, but it was all very interesting. And we, you know, as the younger, as the number eight of nine, it was very interesting to listen to I mean, these different opinions depending on the age. And of course, our older brothers, Joe and Jack, particularly because they were the oldest, uh, were very interesting, with, particularly with my father. You know, they could make a terrific conversation about uh, why are we holding back and why shouldn't we get in there and, you know, and making points. And I think, you know, it sticks with you forever if you get at an early enough age. So it made a huge impression on me and all of us, I think. And I try and do it a little bit with my children. As well, well, I was going to ask Steve you Steve certainly did, yes. Steve, did you feel yeah. that? Did you feel the same atmosphere in your house growing up that the ambassador describes in her book? Well, um, I remember going to Thanksgiving dinner every year, and my grandmother would ask us about um, Roger Williams and the founding of the state of Rhode Island and why Ro Roger Williams founded it. And so you, ha you felt you had to be prepared for, uh, for questions that you were not able to answer. Um, I do actually have a kind of a funny story I wanted to tell, which is my mother and Arthur Schlesinger were great friends, and they used to have um, playful teasing with each other. And it was 50-50 who would get the better of who. Um, but Arthur was known for, um, on somebody's birthday or a special occasion, like today, he would say, well, today is the the day that the first can of beer was canned in America and the first game was played in the American Baseball League and also Governor Winthrop's telescope was burned in the Harvard fire. And those things actually all did happen today. Right. Um, and so my mother said, well, look, Arthur may be smart, but he's not that smart. He's got a book that he's looking this stuff up in. <laughs> so when, when we go out to play tennis, why don't you go into Arthur's room and find the book, <laughs> and I will embarrass him at dinner. And I said, Mom, you want me to go into your guest room? And she was like, yeah. So I, <laughs> so, so I did. And so when Mom got back from tennis, she said, did, did you find the book? And I said, yeah. She said, well, do you have it? I said, I'm not going to take the book out of Arthur's room, Mom. She said, well, what's the book called? I said, it, it's called The Almanac of... American History by Arthur Schlesinger. <laughs> so being around Arthur Schlesinger growing up and, and these other figures who surrounded my uncles who were just kind of giants, Ted Sorensen, um, and they were just an enormous, uh, made an enormous impression on you as a young person. Uh, Cesar Chavez, John Lewis, um, you know, it's, it's very uh, privileged to be able to meet these great men great. as a result of, and of course, my mother was close friends with a number of uh, Broadway songwriters, Sammy Kahn and Adolph Green, who wrote Singing in the Rain, and Cy Coleman, who wrote The Party's Over, and they used to come to our house and play um, on Christmas, all three of them, wow. which was incredible. What an incredible memory. So, Did your mother to, quiz you at dinner and to make sure that you knew? Uh, yeah, she did. Yeah. <laughs> so that you carried that from your childhood as well. You know, you mentioned in your remarks, Ambassador, that there's just such a wide range of ages among you, the Kennedy yes. children. Yes. 
Um, your godfather was your brother Joe. That's right. Right. That's the so how, w uh, the distinctive quality of your family is the loyalty among you all. Yes. How do you maintain that when you have that amazing disparity <laughs> in ages? Well, because we had so much in common. We grew up, to, you know, together. And there was always that conversation about who, who's doing it. I mean, somebody was graduating or they're having a difficult time, and then the other brother would come in and say, well, what, let's talk about it. It's not as hard as it looks. You know, and we just got used to that. Uh, to because we had so much fun together. I mean, we had all had a sense of humor, and they were very good about keeping us occupied and learning tennis and going sailing and going swimming. And you and this take her, show her how to hit the tennis ball. And, you know, it was all play. And, you know, it wasn't all play, but I mean, doing the holidays and things. It's all, it's all and uh, so, and we all had dinner together and everything growing up. And we always talked about interesting things. And of course, that was. And the war was coming, the Second World War and all that. So it was well, when the Second World War was coming, you were right in the middle of it because you were all I in mean, London. It was discussed at the, yeah. you know, whether we should go in or not go in at right. great length. But, you know, and they, my parents were very good because they gave us all, uh, you know, they encouraged us all. They didn't just ask the older boys or something. Mm -hmm. I know, only, you know, obviously more talking to them, but then we'd be listening. But, but he'd always ask at the end, well, Gene, what do you think? Is this going to be hard on wives and sisters and children and, you know, those kind of questions that a woman might be able to answer more or something. Mm -hmm. And so they were very clever at it, and they kept us, uh, in, you know, informed and interested in the world affairs. And I think that's sad about today a little bit, because I got some letters on the book about that, the fact that they couldn't really talk to their children about things like they used, like they would like to because of the television all the time. Because of the things that they see in the media. They feel that they well, don't have the same. There's a lot of shows and stuff that I don't know too much about because it's the age is younger. But they play games and things like that, which is the times they were in. But I think it's taken away. Yeah, some, if your children are all playing video games, you're not sitting around the table talking about politics or world events. Isn't that the way you grew up? Yeah, that's the way we grew up. Because it didn't, there's no television. We went to England in 38 and 39. And that's the first time I saw a television set. Right. When you were in so England. it isn't that old, really. Yeah. No, now not it's really. much more. <laughs> now it's much yeah. more prevalent. So when you would be at those dinners, you and um, you and uh, and Senator Kennedy would be at the at the children's table there. You and Teddy were you the, <laughs> were you the closest complex. to each other? Because you were the two littlest. Uh, were we the closest growing up? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Well, Bobby too. And Bobby you know, too. The, because when they got very heavily talking. I was the older people, no, Joe and Jack, and, but we liked to listen to them anyway. Because yeah. I mean, particularly Bob, because there was a big range there between, you know, there was Joe and Jack at the top, but then there was Rosemary and Kick and Eunice and Pat, and, and so he was looking for another brother. Yeah. So he would hang out with them and listen to what they had All to right. say That's from a very know. early age. So, um, I think you, Steve's you have anything to do? You want to tell what Grandma would do to discipline you when you were naughty? What was that? The closet, the maybe? Closet. Well, the, the closet, closet story, perhaps? Oh, the closet. Uh, that's a pretty good story. Well, everybody knows that story, don't they? Does everybody know the closet story? <laughs> no, see, they want to hear the closet story. Uh, the closet story was that if you were really naughty, mother would put you in the closet. And then, uh, but you were just supposed to sit there and reflect on how naughty you were, which doesn't, <laughs> at that age, doesn't last very long. <laughs> so... So you could hear people playing outside. And most of the time, it was either myself alone or Teddy alone and Pat, and probably Pat and Bobby, the four youngest. And, uh, <coughs> but one day, Mother made a mistake, and it's in the book. And uh, she put uh, Teddy in the closet. Is it Teddy or me? Yeah. And then, uh, then she put me in the closet. That was a mistake. <laughs> because we tried on all her shoes and she didn't. <laughs> it's a long story. It's in the book, but anyway. Uh, uh, you had a lot of fun. We had fun in the end. We had fun, but mother didn't. <laughs> a lot of more fun. But we did have fun. The but the real, the, which isn't in the book, is that later when Ethel went to, uh, on a trip overseas with Bobby, she asked mother, my mother to come down and look. It's not in the book. Uh, 
after her children, of which she had then about nine. And it, she eventually had 11. It's 11 with, and she asked mother to come down and sort of to keep an eye on all of them. And she said, mother, to her shock, she said, was met at the door by one of the younger Kennedys, Robert Kennedys, and immediately taken to the closet. And she said, well, that, that's not, see, I can hang my coat here. Yes, dear, where's the, oh, no, you should stay here and look all over the closet. <laughs> well, I don't really want to stay here. I want to go and see my room here. <laughs> and they said, well, we'll be back in a minute. <laughs> and anyway, so then they said, well, well Grandma, Joe, Joe told me this, the oldest son, he said, Grandma, we're sorry, but you have to see the closet because if anybody's naughty, then you can put us in there. <laughs> wow. <laughs> so, Those are good so kids. Every, They're planning ahead. <laughs> yes. So everybody knew about the closet. But, um, Could you but, tell us a little bit about Cape Cod? It, Cape Cod is almost a character in your memoir. The way you talk about being there and the activities you did. It was home, more so than Bronxville or other places yeah, you had lived. Some place we spent a long time in the summer. So Bronxville was Christmas, but short. Mm -hmm. And then very short holidays. Right. So we, the time we were all together was in the summer, and it was the Cape. The Cape. Yeah. Because so of the that's big age, why it's all right? about sailing and age, I mean, and all that. As we got older, of course, some of us went skiing. Mm -hmm. And, uh, but like Jack couldn't ski or anything like that. So, I mean, it would depend. And, so you, were, you did develop your own interests. You did uh, all basically, have to sail. But we, we used to, uh, we usually went together in a group. I mean, Steve, you know, remember, we went skiing a lot in our family. Mm -hmm. So we went with Pat and we went with Bobby. Uh, Jack couldn't ski. But, you know, so we figured all out and we spent a lot of time together. Right. So that's why it was such a happy family. We wanted to spend time, and um, is that a that's product? My Do you parents. think that they're so your parents nurtured that in you? Absolutely. And it sounds like your brothers and sisters were your best friends growing yeah, up. They were. They were absolutely. Yeah. Because they were interesting, and they were always, and they were creative about things, and they, you know, they liked sports a lot, which is always fun. You know, go swimming together, sailing together. Mm -hmm. And, I mean, it wasn't a social life. I mean, we didn't have, they didn't have dinner parties or anything like that. Right. No, I've never been to a dinner party that mother and dad gave right. my life. Right. So most of the activity <laughs> at high school was children. built around the children. And, all the children. And, and, and then take sports. care of each other. That's the mm -hmm. idea, you know. Every, every, the older one took care of the younger one. Yes, exactly. Yeah. So and did look it. Look after her and look after her. So you must, have, you must have inherited uh, Teddy. I certainly did. <laughs> <laughs> no, we, we were very close. We were, yeah. No, he was good. He was good fun. But everybody loved Teddy because he was very funny. Well, in your book, you describe him as the most sort of voluble and amusing and entertaining of the bunch. It sounds like he was always on stage from the time he was a little kid. <laughs> well, I wouldn't say he was most. Stevie would have dressed that better because he's one of the boys. <laughs> but uh, he, was, he was always very funny, wasn't he? Very funny. Yes. And uh, very good fun to be with. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And everybody loved him for that. Mm -hmm. Steve, you were very to... smart. Teddy? Um, well, Teddy was a combination of um, somebody who was uh, extremely astute about human nature, but also extremely uh, Mary most of the time. <laughs> so he was not disillusioned by what he saw in people, and I think he always looked for the best in people. I think the remarkable thing, and I think people who say this, um, one of the reasons that the John F. Kennedy Centennial is sponsored by Orrin Hatch and John McCain is because these guys truly loved him. And he saw people as people beyond whatever their beliefs were, you know, to the fundamental nature of things that we all have in common. And I think that's what, uh, you know, my uncles, and, and as what I learned growing up and with so many different kinds of people, is they always spoke to our uh, shared civic bonds and our common humanity. And Teddy um, did it in a way that made people laugh pretty hard. He had a couple of dogs in his office that would generally just 
um, att not attack, but sort of jump all over whoever came in there, whoever they were from whatever party. Um, they were subjected to the indignity of these dogs. <laughs> and it just kind of disarmed people. It was sort of like crazy. Um, and he used to bring them on the subway in the Capitol with him. You know, and you'd see him speeding by with these dogs. <laughs> and they weren't um, small dogs. No. So um, it's hard to really uh, encapsulate Teddy. Right. But um, you do very well of him as a child. You do tell a wonderful story that I wonder if you could share with us about when you were older and Jack was in the White House. Yes. And um, you and uh, the First Lady snuck out of the White House. Oh, yes. In order to take your children, I think, Steve, you were part of this adventure, right. in disguise to go trick-or-treating. Yes, right. Could That's you tell right. us that story? <laughs> uh, oh, yes. Well, Jackie called me because she ran school at the White House uh, for the kids, and, for, and, and she had my kids, which was Stephen and William. Upstairs uh, in, the, in the White House, in the family room, right? There was a little uh, kindergarten. And they, yes, and they went to school there for a while. We went to, yes. and William went. Uh, and uh, so she called one night and said she wanted to go trick-or-treating in Georgetown in Washington, D.C. And she had a whole outfit, she said, from herself and for me. That she had made herself, of course, right? Uh, well, I don't think so. No, you don't think she made it? <laughs> but I think uh, because it was a sort of sheet with a head. It was a silk, a silk bag. There's, yeah, a, silk there's bag. a photograph. And how, you've got to see this photograph in the book. Yeah, it's like a silk. Yes, and so we went around, all around Georgetown, and I suppose it had to speak. There we are. There's a... I had to speak because she has a very well, known, a very good voice. I mean, she people, did. People Jackie had a distinctive voice. Very distinct. <laughs> and we so we had to watch that. <laughs> she couldn't. So you she must have been the one that had to so say trick, to or say trick or treat. <laughs> and nobody, did, nobody got her. Nobody got it. But you, you must have secret for three years. service men. Do you remember any of us, Stevie? No, because you were very I remember little. one Halloween when um, my Uncle Bobby came to the door with his kids for trick-or-treat, and William and I had eaten all of the candy. <laughs> and we had nothing to give them. And so they came back, and this was while he was Attorney General of the United States, <laughs> and my father was head of the crisis room at the State Department. They came back in a garbage truck, and they started to pelt our house with garbage. <laughs> in Georgetown, <laughs> and my father got a garden hose and started spraying them with the garden hose. Like, that would never happen today. Um, that kind I don't of think so. <laughs> um, I have a very distinctive memory of that, because I was hit by garbage. <laughs> in the psychiatric department. <laughs> <laughs> That's exactly right. I think it started with my mother, actually. <laughs> Everything starts with your mother, <laughs> right? That's what they tell you. Um, but that's just a phenomenal picture and a phenomenal idea of the, you and the First Lady going trick-or-treating in Georgetown. As you say, it could never happen today. And you didn't I think twice think about it. She, they had a person trailing us, uh -huh. a secret service. But he was but pretty discreet. But I hardly discreet. saw him. I mean, not, you wouldn't remember anything if you were a little boy. Yeah, so it was, he was way behind us. Sort of Nobody, amazing. and she didn't, couldn't say anything because her voice is so familiar, so I had to get tricks, I had tricks and trainings come out of my head. <laughs> but and we went, she went, we both went to every house we went by. Pretty good disguise. And, and she didn't get, yeah, she never got recognized. She never got recognized. Should we take questions from yes, the audience? Yes, that's a, would that be, are you up for that? Some questions yeah, from yeah, the audience? Yeah. Um, and Steve, <coughs> you, want, you want to try some of these? I take think them? mom. Well, sure. it's cheaper you to read them. Oh, sure. Oh, yes, I can okay. read them. There, but I don't know if they're to me. If you they're were to deep. pick one character trait or word, or I don't know what that, to Let describe yeah. Mama Rose, what would it be? And do you see the same in yourself? That is That's a fascinating <laughs> question. It, did everybody hear it? If you could, yeah. if you could pick, choose one word to describe your mother, what would trait. it be? A character trait. A, cra a character trait or word to describe Mama Rose, what would it be? And do you see the same in yourself? That's loaded. <laughs> <laughs> uh, let's see. Well, 
Stevie could share this with me. I, I think it was uh, one character trait would be hard. I think her um, uh, well, that's really a hard one because yeah. she was very kind to everybody. Kind, uh, but I think that probably she had a really inquiring mind. I mean, she really was interested in what was going on with everybody and what, why, and uh, what's in that town and what shows have you seen in New York and did you see the exhibition at the Metropolitan and you should see that. I saw it years ago in France. And I love what the Pope said this morning. <laughs> that, and uh, because she read the newspaper every day very carefully. And then, of course, that's in the book that we have to read it too. And she would ask us questions and everything about what's going on in the world. And, and she encouraged discussion among, among all of us. And um, that, that was a terrific thing because, I mean, it gave us an, also, you got a chance to talk to your older brother, President now, Jack, and, uh, you know, and then say, well, I don't understand what you're talking about. <laughs> and he would say, Gene, you never do, but I'll do it again. <laughs> no, but I mean, it would be very friendly. But uh, it was nice because it was all of us involved. And it was a, the times, you know, before the war and so forth were very interesting and he had very strong, my father had strong uh, issues with the war and Americans getting into the war. And uh, so it was very lively and interesting. And he never put anyone down for their opinion, which was great. You know, he was very interested in Teddy, who was very young at the time. What do you think? He'd ask everybody, well, what do you think? So it was very encouraging, and I think it gave all of us an interest in the times and what we can learn from the newspapers or learn from following the times is very important. So what the ambassador is saying is that you should all subscribe to the Boston Globe. <laughs> <laughs> that was what you were saying, That's wasn't it, Ambassador? <laughs> Thank you so much. That's at any time, any time. So well, we finish now? No, shall I pick another? Would you like me to oh, choose another? Are you, like. oh, are you tired? Whatever. Um, Ambassador Smith, would you please share a favorite memory of your late brother, Senator Ted Kennedy? Well, we talked about him, which he would like a lot. Yeah. We talked about him a lot. This oh, so, you, so <laughs> shall we no, that, try uh, another one? Um, did you give your niece, Caroline Kennedy, any advice on how to succeed as an ambassador? Uh, no, but she was very enthusiastic when I said I was going to be an ambassador to Ireland. She was wonderful. She called me. She was one of the first people who called. And she was very, very excited about it. And I mean, she's still there in Japan, which is probably eight years now, isn't it? She just came back. Oh, she just came back. Okay, she just came back. So she had a long time there. And um, I have to tell you one story. It has nothing to do with anything, but it's so funny. Because uh, I was asked to go to, the, uh, to talk to the Japanese about um, uh, an arts program for people with disabilities. And it was at the UN. And so I said, uh, yes, I will. And so we were talking about some various programs that could go to Japan and so forth. And I said, there's a big hit now, and it's called um, Hamilton. Hamilton. And, uh, the, and it's very, but I don't know if it would go in Japan because it's all hip hop. It was like magic. <laughs> hip hop, they, they look so proper, you know, they had navy suits on and they looked really. <laughs> And they let out a scream all together. said, we love hip hop. Did you know that in Japan? Yeah. They loved oh, no. Oh, no. Oh, no. <laughs> well, they loved it, and they started to jump up. <laughs> it, was, it was at the UN and everything. <laughs> they were going up and down in this room and, <laughs> and yelling at the top of their lungs. I mean, hip hop it, turned out to be the universal it's, language. It's unbelievable. I don't know why I suddenly thought of that, but because Bono is now trying to make uh, music our international language. Because You're doing a pretty good job of it, I'd say, wouldn't you? Yeah. Yeah? Yes. Someone here asked a question. Um, yeah, maybe maybe two, one or two more questions. Would that be okay? We finished, have we? Yeah, Unless somebody one, has a one question. One or two more. What? We just, just do one, one oh, more well, question. Just, sure. yeah. S somebody makes reference to your wonderful doll collection. Oh, yeah. Can you tell us about the doll collection that you had as a girl and how it began and where is it now? It's at the, at the uh, our house at the Cape. It's at the big house at the Cape. Yes. 
which uh, the Kennedy family donated um, to the Edward M. Kennedy Institute, which is right next door. So it's used for research now. It's a place for scholars to go. Yes. So your doll collection <laughs> is there. Uh, yes. The doll collection is there. And, and it's all set up. And mother, was, mother and dad were very good. Well, you probably know about it, don't you? Does everybody know about her doll collection? No, no that's yeah. what they're here for. Well, they, they want to hear they were, about your they doll were, collection. Uh, uh, they had the idea that they would ask other ambassadors, and, and, and this is ambassador, uh, to, uh, they would like to buy a doll native to the country they're in, not to the country they came from, not to the United States, but wherever they're representing the United States, they would, you know, pay for it and everything, and would they send them a doll that would, dressed in the native costume. And uh, they went, wanted to give it to their daughter, Jean. And uh, so they sent it to a lot of embassies all over the world. And uh, they were very excited because they, the, they got it from uh, hundreds, of, hundreds of countries uh, all over the place, they sent it to mother and dad. And they brought it home and they were very excited about it. And uh, it's there at the Cape if you want to come visit. <laughs> there you go, there you go. And my final thing in the book, so which made me think of that, because one day we were sitting looking at our, the house at the Cape looks out to the sea, and short buses used to come there. And you can come down from the top of the road to a thing like this, and that's our house there. And so a lot of tour buses would come, and then they said, we asked them they wouldn't come right into the house. And, <laughs> and then they said, fine, that's fine. It was all very friendly. And then we were sitting there one day, and um, the tour bus came in. We were just having lunch. And so my two sisters were there, and they said, tour bus. <laughs> and so we all stared at an out of the tour bus. Came our little friend <laughs> with her hat on and everything, going like this, to about 120 people from Boston. <laughs> it was mother. <laughs> And she said, we said, Mother, what are you doing? And she said, that tour bus stop, it's a new one, and they didn't know where our house was, and they said, where's the Kennedy house? And I thought I should show them. <laughs> so, so. <laughs> Wonderful. That's a wonderful story to end on. Um, but we can't thank you enough for coming tonight. It has been wonderful for you to share your memories of growing up um, as one of the thank littlest Kennedys. And um, I know you're going to be available to sign books for so, some of these nice, thank you all. nice people. Thank, thank you so much for coming. Yeah, thank you very much.